Hey everybody, welcome. Today we're going to be discussing Playtika's IPO and future prospects. Playtika develops and publishes some of the world's most popular social casino games such as Slotomania, Slots, House of Fun, Bingo Blitz, and card games like World Series of Poker. In our discussion today, we'll be talking about number one, the IPO and current valuation, two, current business and sources of revenue, three, growth opportunities, four, key risks, five, competition, and six, future prospects. And here with me to talk about all of these issues, we have, first of all, Matthew Conterman from Bloomberg Intelligence. Welcome, Matthew. And we also have my fellow co-host from the Deconstructor Fund podcast, Eric Kress from Gossamer Consulting. Welcome, Eric. Yo, yo, yo. <laughs> so let's start with the discussion in terms of the, of the IPO, right? So Playtika went public last Friday, January 15th, offering 69.5 million shares at $27 a share, which was above its estimated range of $22 to $24, thereby valuing the company at nearly $11 billion then. Since the IPO, the stock has jumped immediately as trading began. And as of today, which is Thursday, January 21st, almost a week later, the stock is trading at $31 a share or $13.1 billion in market cap. Matthew, I know you've written about Playtika for Bloomberg, and I just wanted to highlight a few points from your uh, from your analysis. I'm just kind of jumping over to that. All right. So first of all, uh, one of the things that you noted is that uh, with respect to competition, Playtika is the market leader in terms of social casino relative to other competitors like Aristocrat, SciPlay, Double Down, Zynga. I think one other thing that you noted is that from an EBITDA margins perspective relative to Zynga, that they are certainly higher. And then when it comes to some of the uh, some of the comps, and especially with things uh, with, um, for example, price earnings and things of that nature, that currently it would seem that Playtika might be being given a premium or might be more highly valued. Could you speak to maybe starting with you, Matthew, in terms of like? talking about the current valuation, what you think, could you speak to like what your thoughts are? Yeah, I mean, this is a business that as it stands today, it prints money. The EBITDA margins are really strong. And that was, you know, as you just mentioned from the chart, um, you know, and, and so that's probably reflected somewhat in the valuation, but given the run-up in the stock after the pricing of the IPO, it's now trading at a at a big premium to Zynga and Zynga is probably the best listed comp. It's, it's a diversified portfolio of companies that's you know, in the casual to mid-core space. And that's kind of where Playtika's sweet spot is also. They also both geographically overlap well. So in general, it's a very good comp. And, you know, at, at some point you have to question what premium is justified. And as it stands today, it's trading, you know, five and a half, five point seven 5.7 times EBITDA. Um, depend, you know, we'll see where the final share count is after the IPO closes. They still have the option to sell more shares. Um, you know, so when, when all is said and done, it's trading at a premium to Zynga um, you know, although those, those margins are fat, you know, it's not as, it's not growing as fast. And so, you know, what are you paying for growth versus what are you paying for cash? And, and that's kind of the big question for investors right now. Got it. Eric, what do you think? Yeah. I mean, I think the, uh, IPO has actually, uh, pushed some of the other games in the space up a bit. Uh, there was some rumors about Tencent acquiring Zynga today, but even before that, when they went public, we saw some movement on Glue and we saw movement on Zynga. And uh, so it's, it is, God, there's a halo effect as, they, as people are valuing this company and, and reevaluating how they value other companies. Um, but what he says is true. They are more profitable. They are sitting on more established long-term franchises. Um, I would argue that they are not as diversified, not even close to Zynga. So in that sense, they should be worth less in, in some ways. Um, but I don't think people really understand that nuance per se, or maybe they do, I don't know. Um, so th that from a valuation perspective, in my opinion, they should be trading at a discount to Zynga to some degree, uh, but uh, that's not the case right now. So we'll see how it all nets out over time. Got it. And so I thought maybe what we could potentially do is talk about their current business. And um, let me actually kind of jump on the screen here. And to your point, like, when you talk about, Eric, the concentration in terms of like, for example, the, the apps. Um, so certainly when we look at the amount of revenue that a few of the apps like Slotomania, as you can see, um, and uh, 
uh, Bingo Blitz, for example, and House of Fun are. So a few games comprise the bulk of their revenue, for example. But, um, and then from a geo perspective, to your point, I mean, when we look at the concentration in terms of, <laughs> by, in terms of country, we see that, you know, 72%, sorry, maybe I can squeeze that up a little bit. 72% of the revenue is from the US and then much lower percentage of revenue from other countries. And so- Right, and if you actually look at tier one English, it's right. gonna be like 90% probably, right? Yeah, now what, to your point though, uh, Eric, one of the things that we've seen is that when we look at some of the titles further down, like June's Journey, which was the Wu acquisition and Best Fiends, which was a seriously acquisition, what you were talking about in terms of they're trying to get away from being highly concentrated in terms of titles, in terms of uh, geo. So yeah, what, what do you guys think in terms of the, the current business? Well, I, again, I think the lion's share is Social Casino and the lion's share is the US. And while Best Fiends, Solitaire Grand, Board Kings, Pirate Kings, I think those are the big games. I think all are, June's Journey, obviously the biggest one, sorry. Yeah. Um, you know, they're sizable games, but they don't necessarily mitigate the risk of being concentrated in social casino, right? Uh, but they're, they're, they're moving that direction, right? Uh, unlike SciPlay, right? SciPlay has, doesn't has, has nothing, right? They have social casino, great social casino games. And that game is, those games are bulletproof. I said, it's like the EA Sports of mobile is fucking social casinos because people stay there forever, right? These 55 year old ladies never go, right? So anyway, I, I love it. I mean, I, I love the business per se, but they do need to, continue to diversify and I think we'll get into it a little bit why that might be a challenge for them going in later but uh, I think diversification is still an issue with these guys yeah I agree I, I mean when, when I said diversification I guess it's across titles but you're right you know most of the titles are sold casino and so if you just lump those together um, which many people do because you know who really differentiates between slot of mania and you know Caesar slots it's all a slots game at the end of the day right and so if you do it if you look at it that way then yeah, you know, you're, you're totally saying this is mostly a slots business with, with some other, you know, basically call options, um, you know, built into the business. Um, and then, you know, you know, again, on the, on the regional split, you know, yes, most of the revenue is the US. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's the best market to be in, in terms of ARPUs and, you know, LTV of customers, you know, but, um, you know, obviously there's a huge opportunity for them, if, especially in Europe. I mean, Social Casino, you know, you know, we can, we can dive into more of the numbers, but you know, it's not as big in Asia for for a lot of reasons. I think I think there, there there's more prevalence of more hardcore games over here, and so it'd be interesting to see you know if they can get any sort of footprint in Asia over time. But Europe is definitely an opportunity potentially. Well, okay, yeah. So so here's the thing: is that like okay, let's let's be real here. Social Casino is not a growth business outside of the U.S., right? So in Europe, I've said this before, but the Europe they they have real gambling on iPhones and and mobile right <laughs> on phone and, and and computers there's no way people are going to be spending money for the insanity of winning virtual currency that's fucking ridiculous like it, it, even the notion that people are spending thousands and thousands of dollars to to buy virtual currency to earn virtual currency or lose virtual currency is 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 mind blowing to me just in general like how big this industry is that's like the first thing right but there's no way in japan korea even uk why would they ever buy play social casino games it makes no sense right because they can do the real thing right and, so, and then to that point you know it's and it's not necessarily something i've thought about holistically but you know as we legalize you know sports gambling first and maybe eventually other sorts of gambling in the us you know what does this business look like in five years if we go down, you know, deep down the rabbit hole of just making mobile gambling in general legal? Yes. And that, yeah, that is a huge threat for them going forward. And not to mention this COVID threat, COVID comp too is, is impossible for them going forward on more of on the short term. But before I get into like the real super kind of like Eric negative rants here for a second, <laughs> like, so the one thing I want to be clear about this company is that Every single person I've talked to said, these guys are bulletproof. Like these guys are the most amazing managers, these Israelis, I guess, that are just absolutely amazing. And these are people I really respect that don't necessarily have high opinions of even people like Frank Jabot or like Nick or at Glue or others. Like I get a lot of mixed sentiment around those people, EA CEO, certainly Activision, Blizzard, but almost universally everyone that knows these guys says these guys are amazing right so let's let's give them that cred right that they know what they're doing um the other thing is that they are completely data driven these are not like unsophisticated operators right they 
are super, super hardcore digital, you know, uh, data-driven guys that have the ecosystems and the infrastructure really to support fighting this IDFA fiasco that we're getting into uh, going forward. Um, and I think the other strength they have or potential weakness, depending on how you look at it, is they are truly like worldwide, right? They have operations everywhere. Um, and in some parts of the world that maybe you wouldn't want operations, but, <laughs> you know, potentially, but, uh, but I think that's actually about a benefit. And as I said earlier, smartly, and I think these guys are smart operators, they went after non-social casino co companies so that they could diversify their portfolio, which is something that I really respect because that's hard to do when you're doing so well in something else like this innovators dilemma thing like King and King who has never diversified outside of this, these puzzle shit, right? And they're, look what the, what's happening to them. They are losing share nonstop every year. It's just getting worse and worse, right, for them. So, so in some sense, like they have a lot of things going for them and they are amazing team. Um, and, and, I, and they have the, I think they do have the, uh, the street cred and the, and the capability of actually uh, building that. And we'll get to the risks in a minute. And I think the other thing you have to keep in mind from an acquisition perspective, now that they're public, they have currency, right? So uh, one big part about going public in general is that you now have stock, right? And stock is super valuable when you're doing acquisitions because you can pay a lot more than you could with just cash, no matter how much cash you have, right? You have almost unlimited stock, which is not true, but you know what I'm saying. Um, so that, that really does help them on the M&A front to scale the size of what they can do on the M&A side. So those are kind of the quick, like, you know, things, strengths that they're going for them. And, and then finally, just to put a button, you know, nail this down is that Social casino is software as a service. Like out of all the fucking genres in this business, I think in some ways these people stick around for a long time. And I think people are starting to understand that this is like a SaaS model in some ways for, for these type of genres, these type of like, come out, you know, forever franchises. And I think Slotomania is, is a good proof of that. And a lot of their casino games are, are good proof of that. So anyway, that's my quick positive take. I'll get to the negative. Later. <laughs> all right. Um, now, maybe we could speak in terms of like the growth prospects. Now, I, I think there's like, to your point, Eric, they've got a lot in terms of live ops technology. They talk about that in the S1. They are, have a very data-driven culture and things of that nature. But, you know, when we talk about growth, and I, I kind of worry because there has been like a lot of their growth has come from M&A. And when we think about how they will continue to grow this year, next year, when so many M&A targets have already been taken by companies like you know, the Consolidator, Stillfront, Embracer Group, uh, and even the bigger company, public companies like Zynga, et cetera, uh, you know, they haven't yet proven that they can build out in the other categories that they have started to enter into. So what do you guys think from a growth perspective? Like, will they be able to continue to grow or will just even industry-wide, are we going to see a pullback? I think organically, you know, 2021 will be tough just because of comps. There will be some, you know, headwind to, to the sales this year. But looking forward, yes, I mean, this can organically grow somewhat. Um, inorganically is the big question mark. What are they going to do with all the money, the equity currency? And we talked about the valuation when you have a really highly valued equity currency, you can do even more with it. You know, when Zynga bought peak, that was half stock that makes the deal a lot more affordable for them. Right. And so, um, with IDFA and we don't have to belabor all the nuances of IDFA because you guys have done that for six months now. Um, but you know, I think there's going to be opportunity for these bigger publishers with large player networks because of the IDFV concept to go out there and acquire some struggling smaller players. And so you look at Zynga raising capital, you look at Playtico raising capital, other companies are coming in the IPO pipeline. I think they're seeing that they're gonna have an opportunity to, to scrape up small stuff here and basically give themselves cheap call options on future growth. Got it. I, I, I think there's, there's two things. I think I, I, I somewhat agree with what you're saying. I think there is opportunities for them now that they have more currency, as I said earlier. The big challenge for them is going after really good businesses that, um, that have either core, particularly core, uh, may be a challenge to grow because of IDFA and, and, and headwinds associated with that. So are they gonna be able to find good companies that, that, that have the potential for growth given the challenges that we have ahead of us, right? So, um, you know, what Zynga did with both, uh, you know, all their acquisitions for that matter, with less degree with Peak, 
is that they took them and just kind of doubled down on them, right? And that was because they had the capability and, and the resources in order to do that, execute against UA. But if that becomes more challenging and the efficacy is is, is decreased, then that 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 type of growth trajectory could be problem could be problematic. Now, what I will say is this, is that, um, uh, that, and, oh, sorry. And also, sorry, they have a lot more competition too, in terms of acquisitions as well, uh, going forward. Um, I, I totally lost what I was going to say. Oh, for their core business though, I think, I think their biggest strength is their core business, right? So that they, they should be able to maintain, if not grow that slightly, at least, uh, for the foreseeable future. Although the, uh, the COVID comp is pretty tough, but whatever, but yeah. I think personally that this thing kind of lives or dies by the next acquisition they do, right? They just need a good acquisition to layer on similar to what Zing has done. And so that's what I'll be watching out for as to what they acquire. And, and, and that will be a huge indication of whether or not they can maintain, you know, growth. So, and I, and I would just note, you mentioned the competition for M&A. You guys interviewed a former Zynga exec a few weeks ago, months ago now, Chris and he kind of late. Yeah, he laid it out very nicely that as a public company, the threshold for getting deals done is a lot higher. It's a lot harder to execute deals because you have other things to worry about. It has to be accretive to your shareholders. You can't, you know, right. look five years out. You need to think about next year. What is this going to do to EPS? And so, um, you know, now that they are public, although they have the currency and they have more cash on the other side, now they got, you know, idiots like me to, to you know, to, 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 you know, say night, you know, bad things if, if we don't like the deal. And so, um, you know, it, it kind of goes both ways in that sense. Yeah, I do think that, I mean, it's going to be a challenge, right? There's just so many players out there with lots of money trying to acquire. And so they do have five internal studios, but to the point Eric made before, which is that this is a data-driven, data-oriented company. Now, the problem with that is that it's both a blessing and a curse. The blessing is that when we talk about these long, payback windows, games with long lifetimes, games as a service, they, they're very strong in those areas. But when it comes to developing new games, that culture, sometimes it, there's, there's a conflict, right? And so I think that they're going to have to prove their ability to like, if they can't go external, can they build internally, which should be, which potentially could be a very big problem for them. But, uh, you know, I mean, I, at least they're going to have capital and things of that nature to, to give it a shot. Yeah, I, I was actually spreading their numbers and then looking at their products and none of their products, most of their products are more than five or six years old, right? Like they haven't come out with a new game that's been successful ever, right? Like not in the last like eight years, you know, I think if, I, yeah. the way, if I'm looking at this cor correctly, with, besides their acquisitions who are were more, more new, but they're, they're th their, their biggest games are all like super old, right? So so they have no track record of building new games. That was actually my biggest criticism of Zynga back in the day was that Zynga has absolutely no capability of building new games. Now, they proved me wrong with this fucking goddamn Harry Potter game, which I look like an idiot. But um, but in terms of like natural motion- Is that a new game or is that more of a, you know, a brain well, slap? <laughs> well, the, the Willy Wonka game was their first task. And I, and I completely dismissed that game out of hand because I knew they were going to screw that up, right? Because they had no experience doing it, whatever. But they learned from their mistakes and they threw the Harry Potter license on it and it's, and it's killing it right now, right? Yeah. It's insatiable need for puzzle games. It's just like, it's, it's, it's insanity, but whatever. Anyway, so they're doing well with that. So, but we haven't seen anything like that from these guys. Um, right. So anyway. Okay. That's, that's the so maybe moving on to the next topic, and we've already kind of discussed some of the risk here in terms of their ability to continue to grow. But if we look at some of the risks listed in their S1, for example, they mentioned debt levels, they mentioned IDFA deprecation. They also mentioned that the owner of Giant, this guy named Yuzu Shi, who controls Alpha Frontier, which was a consortium that acquired Playtika from Caesars, and which basically controls almost any decision Playtika can make right? There was also talk about Chinese ownership potentially impacting M&A due to the potential conflicts given CFIUS, uh, the Committee for Investment in the U.S., although now under a Biden administration, maybe that's not such a big deal. But of all the risks kind of mentioned, are there any other risks that we should be thinking about that may have been missed? Uh, well, you know? I mean, okay. The, the, well, the two risks that you kind of mentioned there is, I, I actually mentioned this last a few weeks ago and I felt like an idiot because I, or not an, not an idiot, but an asshole because the way I said it, but there's tons of geopolitical risk with this company because it's a Chinese owned 
you know, Israeli made, Ukrainian developed. I mean, like there's, there's so much shit going on that like any of these type of things like start to fall in any way or some kind of political problems, then then that creates some issue with uh, with with their business. And a lot of people in the investment community see that and they see that as a risk and they don't want anything to do with it, right? And so that is a challenge for them to get attention from some of the biggest investors out there. That's what I'm trying to say. Not that I care whether or not they're Ukrainian or not. It has nothing to do with that. It's just a question of what risk are they willing to bear by owning a stock like this, okay? So that's one thing. Um, the regulation risk, you know, these guys are freaking evergreen targets <laughs> in, in Western territories, generally speaking, for regulation. Because frankly, their monetization design on these social casino games is freaking egregious, right? You know, it's just the same as the slot machines in Vegas, right? It's exactly the same people that make the same exact games. And you're, and as I said earlier, you're doing it not even for real money, right? And so this is going to be constant, like, focus on people in, 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 in the U.S. Now, do I think that's real a real risk? Not really, because they're not, you're not cashing out. You're not really, it's not gambling by any stretch, but it's, it's still, there is some risk there to some degree. Um, and I think the other M&A issue that I tried to articulate before is kind of a huge risk for them is that IDFA is going to create problems with their existing portfolio to some degree in terms of acquiring new users, particularly for social casino, because that's a super aggressive, like, you know, UA arbitrage type stuff to the extent that Apple or Google or both uh, start doing policies, which hurt re-engagement campaigns, like collecting emails, doing logins, like all these things that may or may not happen, IP tracking, et cetera, uh, that may cause issues with them in terms of, uh, of ret retargeting their audiences, you know, the, the things. But it's also, I think, creates a lot of heart potential risks for uh, M&A strategy, right? So anybody they acquire, any type of new games that are in the pipeline, you know, could have risk in terms of scaling. So those are the, those are the big ones I see. Totally agree. I, I would just add on, on Joe's point about the Chinese ownership. You know, we, we've we've done work on this in regards to like Tencent and their, you know, network of investments and ownership abroad. The, the real question mark is data collection and, and data sovereignty. And as long as you're not sending user data, player data back to China, which it's just a financial owner, it's not it's not like TikTok where, you know, they were sending data to Singapore servers, as they said, but who knows where that goes from there. Um, you know, the Trump administration would allege that it wouldn't go back to China, and that's what they were worried about. Um, you know, and, and so I, I don't think the risk is super strong there, but, you know, it, it, in, in the current environment, and it's not like the Biden administration has come out and said anything positive about China. They've been awfully quiet on China. Actually, Janet Yellen in her Senate hearing this week was actually saying they're going to continue to be tough on China. So, you know, I, I think people that are expecting a different stance on China overall and how that affects the games industry. I think you're being a little bit misguided. Does it get worse? I don't think so, but I don't think it gets any better anytime soon. Got it. All right, maybe shifting to competition. I mean, you know, the market leaders, I, I, I think we've seen that, especially in certain markets where, you know, like the App Store, for example, generally being the market leader accrues additional benefits and in, in, in economies of scale and things of that nature. But who should, you know, who should Playtika be most worried about with respect to their current market in social casino? Uh, the social casino industry doesn't seem very dynamic by, de by almost by definition. Like it's a, a trench players that maintain audiences. You know, they move back and forth between one and the other. But if you actually look, I've looked at these things a lot and they all seem pretty well. <laughs> I mean, there's going to be no new entrance into the market after this IDFA thing. So like, I think, I think they're relatively protected, you know, with their existing games. From new and, entrants, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Anyway, but I, I, I don't know as much about the social casino space as maybe I, I should, but, um, but it seems like so stable, right. generally speaking, that um, that I, I'm not really too worried about the competition from, from a social casino perspective. I, again, I'm more concerned about the um, competition from acquisition. So, would you rather be part of Zynga, which is a Western operated Western company, or would you be rather pop you know, a, a part of something like uh, Playtika, which is questionable. Like, who's running the show? Right? <laughs> like, do you are you reporting to Israel? You're reporting to China? You report to Ukraine? You know, like, like what, what what's going? Like, you know, what I mean, like that that sure. that could be more of a challenge for them going forward from a competition perspective. Is on acquisitions, still front, Embracer, whatever. These guys have lots of money, so that's the yeah, only, I think that's I the think way I look at it. 
I think we'll see what the space looks like post IDF. I think that's a big question mark in terms of the UA's, you know, the UA efficiency. But like, Moon Active is probably the one that jumps out and says these guys kind of came out of nowhere um, and, and surged up the ranks. And you know, as we're talking about Social Casino, we also have huge games, which is Polish. You know, they filed for an IPO right. in Warsaw, so they're going to list Jesus. in a few weeks also. So, you know. Um, everyone's raising capital and, and I've, I've always said, you know, raise money when you can, not when you have to, the yeah. window is open, you know, things are good right now. Numbers from last year are great before, you know, stuff hits the fan with IDFA, you know, maybe this is just the right time to be raising money. And so, um, you know, I, but I, I, so I think moon active is kind of like the only one that like these guys came from nowhere. Everyone else is like the usual, the usual suspects. Right. But they, they came at it from a different angle, right? Like I, yeah, I even have trouble considering moon active, a social casino company in the sense that the, I'm sure there's a lot of affinity. I really, yeah, I really want sensor tower to pull them out of that. It's more of an invest <laughs> express game than a social casino game. Right. I, I I think that's a, just a misclassification. But, I've had but the to Nappy's right. point, theoretically, they could try and compete in that space by making a product, assuming there's enough affinity between their current audience and then. No, that's true. That's true. Maybe. All right. Just to wrap this up, future prospects. Okay. Given everything that we know, given you know the risks that we talked about, uh, the current valuation, what do you guys think? What is the future prospects for Playtika? Is this, is it a buy, Eric? You tell me. Matthew, I'm gonna let you go first <laughs> on this because yeah, go ahead. Um, I think where the valuation is currently at, at you know, such a premium to, to Zynga, when you couple in the risks around, they've never done large M&A that's been successful. Because mm -hmm. um, that's kind of what you're, you're basically buying that they're gonna be successful with M&A all of a sudden with all this money. Um, plus you, as you mentioned, you have the geopolitical stuff, you have some other stuff, you have the IDFA stuff, plus you just have a hangover in 2021, you know, it, it, it's, everything is priced to perfection in the gaming space right now. Multiples across the board of every company are at peaks or at records right now. And so it, it's, it's tough to sit there and say that anything is necessarily a buy, um, particularly something where you, where you identify all these risks. Now I'm going to say that in September, we sat here and said the same thing about unity and the stock has gone up. 300% or whatever. So, you know, <laughs> maybe I'm just stupid wrong and I don't understand the markets anymore, which is entirely possible because we've seen companies with zero revenue now getting $70 billion market caps. But, um, you know, we'll, 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 we'll see what happens with this one for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, you can always be correct on the fundamentals and wrong on the valuation, <laughs> right? That's the hard part, right? Sometimes. But Here's, here's my concern with this company right at this moment. And if I were uh, on the fundamental side, I think there is, there is a reason to be concerned, right? First of all, they've had sequential declines for the last two quarters, right? According to Sensor Tower, right? Which is not a good, do, good deal going into an IPO, right? So they will have to reverse that in order to grow next year because they do have a tough comp in the first half of last year, right? So therefore, they're in, a, they're in a trajectory to really underperform in the first half of next year, even without IDFA and without the comp itself, per se. Well, actually, sorry, with the comp and with IDFA. Um, so that, that's something that needs to be reversed. And, and it's a little scary that they're going out with a, a sequential down revenue. Um, according to Central Tower, of course, there could be some inaccuracies, but they tend to track well. The second thing that I would say is that I don't know the answer to this question, but what I do know is that Zynga and other companies like Zynga have been doing M&A forever, right? They've had people in, on, on board, you know, boiling the ocean for years and years and years and, and doing that. And I don't think Platika necessarily ha may have that type of capability. I could be wrong, right? I could be wrong. They may have like lots of things lined up waiting for capital to buy, right? Um, so that would be the question. And I think that's my biggest fundamental question is like, they, they are not worth this valuation based on the current business that they have. The only way that they can justify this valuation is if they could continue to grow through M&A. And, and again, I do not think they can actually grow through um, um, organically and, and justify these valuations fundamentally. So I, I agree. I mean, I, I would say I just go back to, you know, the interview you guys did with, the, with Zynga, his former exec, because I think that was... He laid out, you know, kind of how they built their M&A expertise over many years. It doesn't happen overnight. You just don't suddenly 
know how to buy and integrate companies. You have to have a long-term plan in place and, and gain that knowledge by simply making mistakes along the way. And so they started small. I think they got lucky with natural motion, but other, other than that, they started small dude, and worked natural their way motion up to was big... a disaster, dude, by the way, just to be clear. CSR2 but... is still doing okay. But other yes, than that, yeah. Other than that, it's been a yeah. money pit. But yeah. But you know, the other deals they've done recently, they've continued to get bigger and bigger and, and they've done better and better with those. And so yeah, so I think that uh, you know, that that takes time to hone that expertise. You don't do that overnight. Yep. And and and, the, and this is not like tucking in acquisitions that are like twenty to hundred million. These are acquisitions that are material to a business that has billions in revenue, right? So that's what we're talking about. We're not it's like buying coin. What's the coin? You just said it. I just totally forgot. Who's the coin? Oh, oh Moon Active. Moon Active. Coin like Master? acquiring something like that, or play T play Playrix, or or you know bigger companies that like that. That's what we're talking about. Integrating that sort of thing. So. All right, great. Well, I think that basically does it. Thank you very much for your time, guys. And that's our take on Playtika. Thanks, guys. Bye bye.